Hello everyone, thank you for joining me. Um, welcome to the webinar. My name is Lauren Yachimovich and I'm, an, I'm the Flow Cytometry Application Development Scientist with ASEA Biosciences and I'm based here in San Diego. Today I'm going to be discussing how to measure calcium flux measurements on the flow cytometer, specifically on the Novocyte. First, I'll overview calcium flux and how it's generally done by flow cytometry. Next, I'll demonstrate a calcium flux experiment with Jerkat T cells, including experimental design, real time acquisition, and sample analysis. Afterwards, I'll be available for any questions. Please type in any questions you have into the QA chat window, and I will answer all questions at the end of the session. Calcium is an important and ubiquitous secondary messenger. It's a key component of numerous cellular processes. Importantly, calcium is not synthesized or metabolized, but stored and released by channels or pumps that maintain calcium in distinct cellular compartments, such as the endoplasmic reticulum. Calcium efflux occurs upon calcium channel activation, which leads to a rapid increase in intracellular calcium concentration. Calcium efflux is one of the most rapid cellular responses, ranging from faster than a microsecond to several minutes, depending on the stimuli. So how is intracellular calcium measured in an experiment? There's different methods that can be used to measure the levels of calcium inside of a cell. Flow cytometry, which is what we're going to be discussing in this webinar, also confocal microscopy, as well as microplate reader-based assays. So what are the advantages of using flow cytometry to measure calcium flux in your cells? Firstly, by using a flow cytometer, you're able to measure the calcium concentration in individual cells, as well as allow rapid analysis of thousands of cells. Also, flow cytometry allows the capability of multi-parameter analysis, such as coupling calcium flux measurements while monitoring expression of a cell surface receptor, allowing you to get more data in a shorter amount of time. So the reagents that are used to measure calcium flux by flow cytometry are several commercially available fluorescent calcium indicators to dyes, which increase in the presence and binding of calcium, such as the ones indicated below. In the following experiment, we will be using Fluoro 4AM to measure calcium in your cat T cells. Fluoro 4AM is a calcium indicator that is used to measure calcium flux both by flow cytometry and confocal microscopy. It's an AM ester derivative of Fluoro 4 and is converted into the fluorescent Fluoro 4 after diffusion into the cell. Upon binding to calcium, Fluoro 4 fluorescence increases more than a hundredfold, which can rapidly be quantified by flow cytometry. Emission for the calcium bound fluoro 4 can be detected with standard FITSI filters. Since I'm going to be showing calcium flux data from T cells, I just want to briefly overview calcium signaling in these cells. Calcium signaling is essential for T cell activation, survival, proliferation, and differentiation. The T cell receptor engagement which is the first step in T-cell activation, rapidly increases calcium concentrations in these cells. The increased calcium is important for activating key downstream molecules in this, in this signaling pathway, such as calcineurin. Before I show you any data um, from the acquisition or analysis, I'd first like to overview the experimental setup for the data I'm going to show you in this webinar which is measuring calcium flux in Jerkat T cells by TCR activation. This will give you some context for today's experiment, but will also give you an idea of how most calcium flux experiments are uh, normally done on the flow cytometer. First, the cells are loaded with a calcium indicator dye. It is important that the cells are in the logarithmic growth phase, which is important to have the optimal response to the calcium flux stimulants. 
Next, the cells are rinsed and allowed to rest for a period of time to allow for the complete deesterification of internal AM esters. This is an important step to decrease the background fluorescence of the sample. Next, the baseline fluorescence of the cell is measured. This is done so that you are able to measure the amount of increased fluorescence occurs after and during calcium flux. Next, for the actual data acquisition, you add the calcium stimulant, which can be a calcium ionophore, antibody, or other small molecule, depending on the experiment being run. In this experiment, we're going to be showing um, <clears throat> the addition of anti-CD3 antibody to induce TCR signaling in your cat T cells. The immediate collection of the sample is essential after addition of stimulants to ensure that the response is actually measured. Data after addition of the stimulant is appended to the same sample of the baseline. So here's the baseline and the actual response. Um, as you can see, rapid increase in fluorescences in the FITSI channel shows that these cells are in fact experience calcium flux due to the addition of um, the calcium stimulant. I'm now going to demonstrate how the calcium flux experiment will be acquired on the Nova site. I think this is easiest to see in real time since specific settings are required for proper analysis. So you're going to be running this experiment with me. After creating the sample, the first thing you need to do is set the proper stop condition. The sample stop condition needs to not be based on event number, but on a specific volume acquired. So for this experiment, I have disabled the stop condition um, in the events and set it to 25 microliters. Next, um, for this experiment, it is only necessary to collect the fluorescent signal from the FITSI channel for fluorophore AM. So I have unchecked all channels besides forward scatter, side scatter, and FITSI. The flow rate needs to be set to slow, and it's necessary to disable the rinse after sampling checkbox for these calcium flux experiments. For all data to be appended properly, the next step is really important. In the Settings tab, go to the Experiment um, button and, and make sure that the Keep Time Gap Fixed When Appending Sample Events for Calcium Flux checkbox is selected. This is a setting specific for the calcium flux assay and allows you to change the gap so that appended data is set to the physical time it takes to load the sample and begin acquiring data, which keeps the gaps consistent between your samples. I've now just made the basic uh, forward scatter and side scatter gates to be able to show the plot of interest, which is the fluorescence in the FITSI channel over time. First, we will, be, we will start by running the sample for its baseline level of fluorescence. The baseline is run to be able to get the background fluorescence signal of the cells to compare after the stimulant is added. It should remain consistent during acquisition. If it doesn't, it's usually because there's some kind of residual calcium stimulant in the, um, from the previous sample. I'm showing this in, um, I think, about four times the speed, just so that you can see the entire um, an acquisition of the sample. After the baseline is acquired, you'll be appending data to the same sample after addition of a calcium stimulant to cause um, a calcium flux response. In this experiment, I will be adding anti-CD3 antibody to cause a T-cell receptor activation, triggering calcium flux in my cells. First, you need to change the acquisition um, <clears throat> stop condition to 125 microliters so that additional data can be acquired over time so that you could monitor the response. 
Before you add the calcium flux stimulant, you're going to want to select run because there is an additional step required before actual da data acquisition that you have this pop-up window show up. And now you want to add your um, calcium stimulant. <coughs> Um, this ensures that the amount of time that elapses after addition of the calcium flux stimulant to the sample is as small as possible. So um, when appending data, make sure that this fixed time gap uh, checkbox is selected. Add the stimulant, quickly vortex the sample, and initiate acquisition of your sample. After um, analysis of your sample occurs, you should be able to see the calcium flux occur in real time by the increased fluorescence in the FITSI channel. which it just takes a second for it to start acquiring. So this is in, um, again, is four times the speed, just so you can see the entirety of the uh, calcium flux response. So you see an immediate increase in the um, fluorescence in the FITSI channel, showing that there is an, an, a very rapid calcium flux response. So after we're finished um, acquiring this data, I'll go further into the specific data analysis that can be done in the Nova Express software. Now I'm going to demonstrate how to do um, further data analysis in our Nova Express software. First, I'm just doing the normal gating on cell populations in forward scatter, side scatter. In the first plot that I'm gating right now, in the second plot, I am going to be excluding doublets with forward scatter height and forward scatter area. Finally, we're going to look at our plot of interest, which is monitoring the fluorescent signal in the FITSI channel over time. This allows ones to look at the change in the fluorescent signal in response to calcium influx. In our program, the best way to analyze the data further than this is to make gates um, in small segments of time to get the average fluorescent signal, which is what I'm doing here. So I'm making gate every 10 seconds and we'll be able to export this these numbers for further analysis. So I've made gates at 0 to 10 seconds, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, etc. through the course of the data acquisition. The um, files can also be exported into Flojo and analyzed using their kinetic function. After you do this, you have averages of fluorescent signal in small segments of time. After making these gates, you can export the mean x time and mean y signal and copy them into Excel to make graphs of the data. This first sample has the calcium flux response of JERCAT T cells to anti-CD3 antibody. As a comparison, in the second sample, I have prevented this response with abrutinib, which is a small molecule inhibitor of IL-2 inducible kinase, IDK, which dampens TCR signaling. Here are the final plots that I generated from this experiment, which shows the response to anti-CD3 antibody alone, as well as the inhibition of this response with abrutinib. The final plots have small gaps, which represent the time that it takes the instrument to load and begin analysis, which is approximately 20 seconds. 
As you can see, abrutinib completely abrogates anti-CD3 induced calcium flux in T cells, which is seen by the absence of a response once the CD3 antibody was added. In this Excel chart, I have um, graphed the data that was exported from Novo Express. On the x-axis is the time relative to the point of stimulation. On the y-axis is the mean fluorescence intensity, the MFI. Showing the data on an Excel chart allows you to evaluate how fast the response occurs by the slope of the increase as well as the response peak in all samples, as well as giving you the ability to visually compare them to each other. Below is a table with the maximum fluorescence of each sample, which allows you to evaluate the peak response. Another way to analyze your data is by calculating the relative intracellular calcium levels, which is the fluorescence of the sample of interest normalized to the untreated control. In this experiment, it was a sample that was treated only with DMSO and no CD3. This allows you to see the fold increase in fluorescence due to the addition of CD3 antibody and evaluate the difference peak responses between samples. As you can see, the cells that are pretreated with abrutinib decrease in their capability to respond to CD3 antibody more than sevenfold. Finally, I want to just overview a couple of the common experimental issues that people encounter when running calcium flux experiments on the flow cytometer and on the novocyte in particular. This can be due to issues with experimental setup, such as the cells not being in the logarithmic growth phase. This can result in a small or absent response to the calcium uh, flux stimulant. Secondly, it may be necessary to optimize the calcium indicator dye concentration and incubation time that's used. Another issue can arise from omitting the deesterification step, resulting in too high of a baseline fluorescence. It may also be necessary to add an organic anion transport inhibitor, which reduces the calcium indicator leakage, such as the commonly used probinicide. Other issues can arise from problems with data acquisition. For the novocyte, it is essential to have this fixed time gap for calcium flux checkbox selected when appending data. Without it, the gap between the appended data will be variable and very large. Secondly, um, an issue in data acquisition can occur if the appended data is acquired too slowly after the addition of the calcium stimulant reagent. This can result in you missing the response in, in, in its entirety. Finally, if there's incomplete rinsing of the SIP tube and line after acquisition between samples, it can result in a changing baseline. So the baseline fluorescence is uh, increases over time, which is usually due to res uh, residual calcium stimulation reagents in the line. I hope that you found this webinar useful. If you go to aciabio.com, there's an application note with additional data on calcium flux as well as additional information on the Novocyte flow cytometer. I'm now available for any questions that you have, and thank you for joining me.